Everybody, the Florida State Seminoles are still trying to cope with life at General Hospital, also known as the FSU practice field. Coach Bobby Bowden has been working his troops mighty hard this fall. And they've responded by hitting harder, and the result has been extra work for the training room cart. As many as 13 players have been out of action at one time, and it's taking its toll. Let's just take, for instance, Danny McManus. Uh, Danny McManus had a good spring for us. We watched him perform. We felt like we'd build things around the things he could do. So he comes back in here and gets hurt. Now, all of a sudden, the next guy doesn't do some of the things he can do, so we have to kind of shift to him. Then he gets hurt. Then this next guy, we've got to shift for him. So it throws you behind in what you're trying to accomplish offensively. You may. And as I said, it's taking its toll. Tomorrow, Bowden and the team will make their annual appearance at the Seminole kickoff luncheon in the Tallahassee Leon County Civic Center. Tickets at $8 a pop still available. The luncheon's set to begin at high noon. The toll for the Florida State Seminoles now stands at 13. Thankfully, no new injuries at this morning's practice. Now, one of the great ironies of getting hurt is that it offers an unknown player the opportunity to rise up and prove himself. And that appears to be what's happening at the FSU practice field, as Mike Fabrizio explains. Last week, projected starting quarterback Danny McManus pulled his groin. But not to worry. Eric Thomas, who was running a close second to McManus, was recovered from off-season shoulder surgery and ready to step in. But yesterday, he too was forced to pay a visit to Florida State trainer Doc Falls. Late last night, just in a, in a routine drill, uh, Eric Thomas, uh, the, the defensive guy, came in and tried to grab a hold of him, and he missed, and he grabbed his arm and hurt his arm a little bit. It's the, his right shoulder, the one he had operated on. But Enter freshman Chip Ferguson, the 6'1", 200-pound Spartanburg, South Carolina native, suddenly finds himself the number one QB. It'd be a good experience for me to get in there early and everything, you know. But, you know, we always want all the other quarterbacks to get healthy real soon. And right now, I'm not even thinking about playing. I'm just thinking about learning. Ferguson was recruited by such powerhouses as Clemson, South Carolina, NC State, and LSU. Is he ready for the task at hand? Well, I believe I could run the offense okay, because I know the offense pretty good. Um, you know, I was a leader in high school, I guess, and um, I guess it, the change from high school to college, I need to be a leader so people look up to me and everything. For now, Thomas and McManus can just stand by and watch as the freshman from South Carolina readies himself for the stretch drive at a starting role. At Florida State, Mike Fabrizio, News Site 27. Last night, ABC's Night News that I can serve the news. The 1984 Florida State football team gave Seminole fans a sneak preview of the young men who would face one of the toughest schedules in major college football. On picture day, no one could foresee the great triumphs and the heartbreaks that lay ahead in the 1984 season. An improved defense and a record-setting offense would take the Seminoles to yet another postseason ball game. Emotion filled Doak Campbell Stadium as Chief Osceola and Renegade kicked off another Seminole uprising. The 1984 Florida State highlight film is brought to you through the support of Sun Banks. Hopes were high as fans, coaches, and players set lofty goals for this new team. East Carolina was the first opponent, and the Knolls chose to begin their attack on the ground. Tied at three apiece, Cletus Jones picked up 20 yards. Rosie Snipes followed punishing blocking to give FSU a 10-3 lead. A reverse to Darren Holloman, a freshman, clicked for 13 yards, and another score. On the ensuing kickoff, one of their own blockers caused a fumble, and number 99, Bruce Hagee, recovered. Two plays later, quarterback Eric Thomas found Hassan Jones in the end zone, and it was 24-3 FSU. Not to be outdone, the defense and number eight, Eric Riley, intercepts. Eric Thomas wasted little time in connecting with Jesse Hester for a touchdown and a 31-3 lead. 
Heisman Trophy candidate Greg Allen hurtled in for six, and the Seminoles went on to crush East Carolina 48 to 17. In most colleges across America, some things never change. And so it was with FSU's explosive offense as it traveled to Lawrence, Kansas. Today's game against Kansas would be a clinic given by the Seminoles in all phases of the game. Number 47, Brian Williams, and number 58, Henry Taylor, began the lesson on sacking. Daryl Gray picked one off. Number 79, Gerald Nichols, got some help from his friends. And the new defense under Mickey Andrews looked conspicuously improved. The special teams, led by number five, Joe Wessel, did their job. And the defense, playing under new management, was showing early signs of dependability. Kansas did manage an early field goal, but Eric Thomas hit Hassan Jones to erase that lead, 7-3. to three. The offensive line opened gaping holes for FSU runners. Gray Gallon carried to the 50. Cletus Jones took it the rest of the way behind precision blocking by the entire front line. The nationally recognized Florida State offense was living up to its reputation. Greg Allen scored twice to make it 28 to 10 FSU. Kansas tried a new quarterback with the same results. Martin Mayhew picked this one off. The Seminoles simply outclassed the Jayhawks in a 42-16 win. You know, head coach Bobby Bowden joked with Miami's Jimmy Johnson, but defending national champion Miami wasn't sure FSU could handle the faster track in South Florida. The Seminole faithful knew this would be the real test for Florida State's new defense. You know, we were really practicing hard. You know, Coach Bowden emphasized to the defense that we needed to put pressure on Kozar. Bobby Bowden called for pressure, and number 31, Billy Allen, delivered. The offense was to keep the ball away from Miami as long as they could. Eric Thomas and Jesse Hester connected on another big first down. Derek Schmidt made the Seminoles' first drive count with the longest field goal in FSU history, a 54-yarder. He added a 40-yarder on their next possession to give Florida State a 6-0 lead. In the meantime, All-American Bernie Kozar was running for his life. An old secondary blanketed Miami receivers, and the front four for Florida State were on fire. While Williams and Scott were burying Kozar, the offense was planning a patented Bobby Bowden surprise. Coach Bowden, he put the play in the week before, and we worked on it all week. So, you know, the situation presented itself. We were deep uh, about a 20 or uh, 30 yard line, and, you know, they had been giving us the reverse, the reverse, reverse. So we came back with the pass, and, you know, I came around, and Jesse, you know, he broke to the corner. I threw it out there, and Jesse, you know, he jumped up and caught it, and it was good for about 40 yards. The offense ground out another field goal to take a precarious 9-0 lead. Number 68, Lenny Chavers, forced a fumble, and number 58, Henry Taylor, recovered. The defense continued to challenge Miami, and number 17, Eric Williams, stole a sure first down. The interception gave Florida State a thin 9-0 lead at the half. We'd worked very hard for that nine points. We'd driven down and kicked a field goal, driven down and kicked another field goal, driven down and kicked another field goal. That's a very slow way to put nine points on the board. So at the half, we had about a third down and a 17, I think, or 12, and we were down our end of the field where we didn't want to risk turning the ball over, and we knew they'd be looking for a forward pass. So we ran the reverse, and Jesse uh, made the best run he's made since he's been in Florida State when he ran 77 yards for a touchdown. Eric Thomas faked a handoff, 
and Hester and Greg Allen crisscrossed in the backfield, confusing Miami defenders. The offensive line maintained their blocks, and Jesse Hester's God-given speed did the rest. It was Florida State's first possession of the second half, and it was a 77-yard touchdown run. The try for two was good, and it was 17 to nothing, Florida State. From the 26-yard line, play fake by Thomas. Thomas still has a ball, throws it downfield toward Hassan Jones. Touchdown of issue! Hassan Jones in the end zone, perfect pass by Eric Thomas. That strike to Jones put Miami on their knees, and it was becoming a Tallahassee lashing. When Rosie Snipes took it in less than two minutes later for the final Seminole score, the lights went out for Miami. This day, the Seminoles added South Florida to their domain. It was the defense's finest hour. Um, our defense just played a fantastic game, probably one of the greatest games I've ever seen, you know, in college football as far as playing against somebody of that caliber. For one, it was a total team effort. Offense played well, defense played great. I think we really came together in that game. Florida State was 3-0, and it destroyed the defending national champion. The excitement carried into the next game against a stubborn Temple University team. Temple met Joe Wessel. Every spring, we try to find a guy that has natural ability in blocking a punt. Bobby Butler with the Atlanta Falcons was a great punt blocker. Uh, uh, Hannah, uh, Warren Hannah was a good punt blocker for Florida State, but Joe Wessel has topped them all, and he is the slowest and the most likely of any punt blocker we've had here, and yet he was in on, he, he was, he's the best punt blocker probably the nation ever produced in college football up to this time. Number five, Joe Wessel began his special brand of havoc in the first quarter. John Eford recovered for FSU. That set up a 43-yard touchdown run by All-American Greg Allen. He leaves behind the records for most touchdowns scored, most yards gained, and highest average per carry. Though he missed most of the last four games, he remains Florida State's all-time leading rusher. Still in the first quarter, Joe Wessel smothered a field goal attempt. And number eight, Eric Riley, picked it up and ran 34 yards for the score. That made it 14 to nothing, FSU. The defense was intimidating the school from Philadelphia and finally took the ball away from them. Eric Thomas teamed with Jesse Hester and Hassan Jones for TDs and Florida State Mall Temple 44 to 27. The game was another showcase for number four, senior receiver Jesse Hester. He went on to lead the Seminoles in receiving in 1984 with 42 catches. Florida State tied Memphis State the following week and came home to fourth-ranked Auburn. The Tigers took the lead 10-3. Eric Thomas hit Pete Patton to tie the game at 10. Auburn, however, came back with two more scores to open a 22-10 lead.
Thomas went to the bomb, and Jesse Hester never changed stride. At 22 to 17, the stage turned sour on the Seminoles. On what may be the most bizarre play of the 1984 season, FSU kicked off and caused a fumble on the run back. In the pileup, the ball popped up into the hands of a surprised Auburn player who ran untouched for an easy touchdown. It was 29 to 17, and time to see if Florida State had the character to fight back. Darren Holloman on a reverse, followed key blocks and scored. The defense and Isaac Williams stayed tough. Eric Thomas hit Hassan Jones to take the lead and the Seminoles made it 32 to 29 with a two point conversion. Rosie Snipes picked up big chunks of yardage. Eric Thomas again found Hassan Jones in the corner to go ahead 41 to 35. But Auburn scored with time running out to escape again by a whisker at a touch of good fortune. FSU buried Tulane the next week, 27 to six. And a real live Western hero would be needed against Pac-10 power Arizona State in Tempe. 96 points were scored in this shootout in the desert. Arizona State plays to a 17 to nothing lead early. Greg Allen ran for 223 yards on just 10 carries. Kirk Coker replaced injured Eric Thomas at quarterback and threw for 203 yards and two touchdowns. But the Sun Devils kept pouring it on. Bobby Bowden called for the special teams and real help was on the way. Lenny Chambers blocked a punt, and number five, Joe Wessel, began his heroics. Joe Wessel broke Florida State and NCAA records with five blocked kicks and three returns for touchdowns in 1984. Joe Wessel's two returns for touchdowns carried the Knolls to a dramatic 52 to 44 win over Arizona State. The following week, FSU lost a heartbreaker to South Carolina and then shut out Tennessee Chattanooga 37 to nothing, then got ready for arch rival Florida. Lined up for this one. For the Seminoles, it was their second national telecast in their last three games. The game was heard over the 70 station Seminole Sports Network. crowd saw a partly sunny free game show turn to swirling winds and an ugly dark sky. The sight of injured star running back Greg Allen in street clothes made the setting even more ominous. And the hand dealt the Seminoles on this dreary December day was as dark as the weather. Seminoles fought to overcome a 17 to three halftime deficit. But the 
Sunbank scoreboard knew the key to FSU's fate in 1984. The rain stopped and Brian McCrary and Florida State came alive. The replacement for injured Greg Allen was number 49, Tony Smith, a junior who fought for 14 punishing yards. That run set up Eric Thomas's pass to freshman Pat Carter for a seminal touchdown. Kirk Coker hit Jesse Hester for another score, but it was too little, too late, as Florida won it 27 to 17. The loss did little to dampen the spirits of the Seminoles, who were bound for the Citrus Bowl. We were always looking forward to playing the University of Georgia, but we knew that they would never play us, and we would never go up to Stanford Stadium and play them. So being matched in the Citrus Bowl was uh, sort of a dream come true. A national TV audience saw Florida State face Georgia, a school they hadn't played in 20 years. Bobby Bowden saw his tribe fall behind again, this time 14 to nothing at the half. The defense was playing solid football. Fred Jones's sack inspired the offense. Eric Thomas hit Pat Carter for good yardage. Derek Schmidt kicked a field goal, and FSU entered the final period down 14 to three. From the two, Tony Smith scored. The two-point try was no good. Georgia kicked a field goal to lead it 17 to nine, and the defense took over. Henry Taylor flattened the Georgia runner, and Martin Mayhew recovered the fumble. A reverse to Jesse Hester put Florida State on the 50. Tony Smith to the 12. The drive stall there, and it was time for the Joe Wessel and Lenny Chavers show. This time, Lenny blocked it, and Joe took it in. two-point play to tie the game was too slick for cameraman to follow. The play went left after a tremendous fake right by Eric Thomas. Number 24, Darren Holloman tied it at 17. And Florida State had come back again from what seemed like sure defeat. The tie was a, a, a really a, a, an in, indicative of the way our team fought in, during the 1984 season. Our kids came back and fought like mad in the fourth quarter of every ball game and came back and tied that ball game and uh, when it looked like everything else was futile. We have a lot of people coming back, a lot of people that are, you know, have the attitude and have the desire to win and so I'm looking for a real good year next year. Yes, we had an uh, excellent year recruiting 1983 and we think we're having a good year recruiting this year. So you just keep trying to put these things back to back and then get a little break in here somewhere where you get that extra little one point that you need, see? That's the only thing that's separating us uh, from the top teams in the nation. We never quit. I think we fought every team to the end, to the last whistle, and I think that's the biggest thing to characterize this team. Many of the players on this team that wouldn't quit are returning. The Seminoles were just four points shy of a 10-2 season in 84, and to many sports writers, Florida State may be the team to beat in 1985.
On behalf of Florida State University, the football coaches, and the football team, we want to thank Sunbank for the great support they've given our Florida State football program, and especially for this FSU football highlight Sunbank film. With the best record in the Southeastern Conference secure, the Gators closed this remarkable season with their fourth straight triumph over arch-rival Florida State, 27-17. In the mud at Tallahassee, John L. Williams finished as one of the most versatile backs in Florida history, leading the team in receptions and gaining over 800 yards rushing. With nine wins against a schedule that included eight bowl-bound teams, Galen's Gators had become what many considered the best team in college football. You know, I think every man... Seminole stampede onto the field. Catch the action as they tackle the nation's toughest teams. Cheer the Knolls to victory. Play after play, game after game, in Seminole territory. Now bigger and better than ever at newly renovated Campbell Stadium. It's hot. It's exciting. It's Seminole football. Catch it, but hurry. Season tickets are going fast. Get them while you can. Seminole football. Catch it. Live. The week has not gotten off to a very good start at Florida State. With the season opener just five days away now, the Tribe lost its starting tailback today because of disciplinary reasons. Coach Bobby Bowden suspended senior Tony Smith for a week because of training violations. He'll miss the Tulane game this Saturday and has been demoted to the scout squad for the remainder of the week. Chuck Wells, a sophomore, will start in Smith's stead. Bowden told Smith if he watches his P's and Q's, he can rejoin the varsity a week from today. Meantime, down in game key players due to injury is something Coach Bowden can live with. But when you lose a starter because of disciplinary reasons, that's another matter. Today, starting tailback Tony Smith was suspended for a week for breaking team rules. He will not play against Tulane. He will continue to practice with the scout team this week. Now that opens the door for Sammy Smith. The freshman gained 67 yards in Friday's scrimmage to lead all FSU runners. However, at this point in time, converted fullback Chuck Wells is listed as the starter. Well, despite the weather conditions, fall is returning to the capital city. The signs are everywhere. The students are heading back to campus. Florida State is scrimmaging again, and there's a new seminal single hitting the charts. Yes, all is well in Tallahassee. The latest single is called I'm a Knowles Fan. It's performed by a local band, the Opaque Brothers. And last Friday, Steve Ocean and I debuted the 45 Live on Gulf 104. The expert, I want you to play it, listen to it, and tell me what you think. Sounds like a hit to me, man. All right, let's go. Let's go. I'm a no man. Yeah, buddy, hit that thing. Okay, for Steve Ocean and Fred the Head, this is I'm a Knowles fan, the Opaque Brothers on Gulf 104. I'm a Knowles fan. I'm a Knowles fan. No doubt about it, it's a big hit out here with uh, Steve Ocean and the rest of the gang. Hey, and you can sing along too. All you got to do is follow the bouncing ball. I'm a renegade. Say. Go ahead, Pilgrim, make my day. And down in Gainesville, they may talk about us, but who can you call? Gator Busters! I'm a nose fan! Pam, you were dancing up a storm. Rate the record for me. Uh, I think the record was a 10. A 10. A 10. I think it's a great song, and I just want to wish the Seminoles and Bobby Bowden a great year this year. I think they got the stuff to do it. And uh, I'm an old man, and I think the song will do real well. We'll play it extensively. So, just who are the Opaque Brothers? In essence, they're Chris Stone and Ron Johnson, a couple of local musicians. And despite Ocean's vow to play the record, they're not above pushing the product. Uh, you can get the record just about anywhere. Just about anywhere. I'm a Knowles fan. Play it, Ron. All righty. Now, as we mentioned earlier... ...under the nub, preseason practice ended just a couple of moments ago for the Florida State Seminoles. Game time in New Orleans versus Tulane is 40 hours and some change away. And as Bobby Bowden says, the hay is in the barn. And Bobby is in our studios live tonight. Coach, that hay is just a tad wet. The roof has sprung a severe leak in the last couple of days. I know it's causing you some problems. Gee, uh, Bob, it's wet and it's a little green right now. We've had, uh, we've had good practices. We've had some setbacks, I feel like, in injuries and in the weather. But I think under the circumstances, 
we're going to be about as well prepared as we can be. Well, that's good to hear. I know Hurricane Elena is causing some problems and concern around this area for obvious reasons. Rumors are spreading like wildfire that the game tomorrow or Saturday against Tulane has been canceled. You've canceled your flight and all that. I know it's not true. What's the situation? No, we're, we're going to leave uh, 1 o'clock uh, Friday to, uh, to fly out there. Now, we might have some difficulty. I do not know. If we did, we'd jump on a bus and go, you know. And, uh, but anyway, all, er everything's on go right now for 1 o'clock Friday to leave. You have just gone live around the state via satellite. What is it the folks in the Sunshine State really want to know about the 85 Seminoles? Well, it hadn't changed, uh, Bob. They, they want to know who the quarterback is. <laughs> you know, that has not changed. And everybody, everybody wants to know about Danny McManus, and that's only natural. Uh, we're, we're starting a new quarterback for this ball game, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him myself. I've seen him in practice. He's done real well. He's passed all the tests so far, and now we're going to get him on television and get him out behind that line against another opponent and see what happens then. I know you're concerned about injuries and the timing because of the weather, but, too, I think the specter of stinking up the Superdome in front of the nation on television is really eating at you as well. Yeah, gosh, you hate to blow an opportunity, and I, I, I don't think we will. Uh, uh, our practices, uh, again, it, it's, it's, it's funny, our, our defense has stayed pretty healthy. Our offense, uh, receivers, runners, and quarterbacks have missed a whole lot. But uh, I, I'm just anxious to see how we're going to do. I, I know we're going to be ready. With, we're going to be ready to play under the circumstances. Coach, I know the people around the Sunshine State join me in wishing you nothing but the best in the season ahead. And don't forget our pregame show tonight at 7:30. The season gets underway for the Florida. 18 to 9 lead over favorite Florida State. They blocked it. Whistle's going to pick it up and go in. This will be a Florida State touchdown. Here he comes, super late, Kevin Butler. This will be his all-timer if he hits this. Five seconds left. Line of scrimmage, the 46-yard line. It's unbelievable. The hold will be, he's trying a 71-yard kick. That's unbelievable. Florida State's not even putting anybody back. Come with everybody. It's on the way. I don't believe it. Oh, just short of the crossbar. He missed by a foot or two. He could have made us. Oh, I don't believe it. 71 yard attempt, and so a difficult ending for both teams who fought every down of the way, only to end in a tie. The first meeting between Florida State and Georgia since 1965. It's hard to imagine where the time has gone. That 17 17 tie in Orlando took place 250 days ago, and it all begins anew in 40 odd hours in the Superdome in New Orleans. The preparation for the season ahead has been intense, hellacious, ranging from brutal to inhumane to nearly comic. Hot Rockin' Z-103, Renegade Rich Stevens is on, it is so hot, look out, 98 degrees now, 103 degrees tomorrow, ouch, oh damn man, he's got it, look here son, your butt's out here, you head on the floor, drive, 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 Directors in days gone by at Florida State had to have a secret death wish, consistently scheduling the likes of Nebraska, Auburn, Notre Dame, LSU, and Pitt all on the road at their place. Well, their past sins are going to come back to haunt the Seminoles again this year. Their road schedule is a killer. A couple of heavyweights will visit Doe Campbell Stadium, and as always, there are the weak sisters.
travel, tons of TV time, and Tulane opened the season for Florida State. It all begins the day after tomorrow at the Superdome in New Orleans. The Green Wave looks to be easy picking. A year ago, they were 3-8 and eight and cleaned house when the season ended. The new man on campus is Mac Brown. He finds himself in a can't-win situation, beginning his head coaching career against his alma mater and before a national cable TV audience. Coach Bowden's always got wrinkles. That's he's, he's known as the riverboat gambler over in Tallahassee, so there's, there's no question about that. From the Crescent City to America's heartland and more television exposure, on September 7th, the Tribe returns to the scene of its greatest victory ever, Memorial Stadium, the home of the wee bad Nebraska Cornhuskers. This game will be carried by ABC. Coach Tom Osborne says of the rematch. No animosity toward Florida State or, or anything like that. We, we think they're a great football program, and I think it'll be a great ball game. After the Huskers, the Tribe gets a break, a week off to prepare for their home opener against the Memphis State Tigers on the 21st. This could be interesting, as both teams have something to settle after last year's 17-17 tie. By the time this game rolls around, the Seminoles should be the ready for primetime players. For the third game in a row, they will be on national TV. The game is being picked up by the Superstation, WTBS out of Atlanta. The following weekend, the Kansas Jayhawks of the Big 8 Conference, one of the soft touches on this schedule, visits Oak Campbell Stadium. After taking the following weekend off, the Tribe will wing its way to the loveliest village on the plains of Alabama. Auburn has a war eagle, a tiger, a big train, and Bo Jackson, who's back again. A brand new passing attack, the bone is dead, and a KG coach in Pat Dye. They are also flat loaded, the preseason number one pick by several publications. The Tigers own the deed to Florida State's house. The Seminoles have never beaten Auburn at Auburn. On October 19th, it's back home for a quick cup and to check the mail. The Golden Hurricane of Tulsa comes to town with a new look, new helmets, new unis, and a new coach, rookie Don Morton. Earlier, I mentioned weak sisters on the schedule. This is one of them. In my mind, I'm gone to Carolina. Can't you see the sunshine? Can't you just feel the moonshine? Beginning October 26th, the Tribe will definitely have Carolina on its mind. In 22 days, FSU plays North Carolina at their place in Chapel Hill. Then it's South Carolina with black-clad coach Joe Morrison. The powerhouse Gamecocks come to town on November 9th. And the Western Carolina Catamounts will be the homecoming opponent for Florida State to fatten up on on November 16th. Sandwiched in between those Carolinas north, south, and west is longtime buddy Miami, A.B., after Bernie, Bernie Kosar. The Hurricanes visit the capital city on November 2nd. They play extremely well, no great, at Doe Campbell Stadium, having won seven of eight games in Tallahassee. And finally, the finale. The Seminoles end their season as they always do against the boys from old F-L-O-R-I-D-A in Gainesville. The Gators have a hammerlock on the Seminoles, having won four straight. This will be the hottest ticket in years, a guaranteed standing room only affair. The only way to see it, in person. No TV, as the Gators are on probation. No offense in the country can lose the likes of Greg Allen, Rosie Snipes, and Jesse Hester and not suffer for it. But as longtime Seminole fans know, Bobby Bowden never really rebuilds. He simply reloads. And he's done it again this year with a strong stable of runners, veteran wide receivers, and a huge offensive line. Here with the story on the guys who provide that firepower is Scott Atwell. There's an old saying that advises, if something ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, it's not to say that the Seminole offense of a year ago was broken, but coaches have made some minor adjustments, which they hope will help realize some major goals. Now, the best way to beat people is to take the football and, and, and knock it down their throats and don't let them have the football. But uh, you can't do that every Saturday. So we're trying to have the same ability to throw as we are the run, where last year we got heavily run and could not throw as well. The 1985 offensive scheme will place more demand on a passing quarterback. The position was won over spring drills and maintained through pre-fall by Danny McManus. The sophomore signal caller draws his first starting assignment with only 10 varsity passes under his belt. 
There's times that yeah, I just sit around and just wonder what it's going to be like with 60,000 people watching me play this sport. You know, I got that's 120,000 eyes just looking at me, <laughs> and it's just something you know, that I've really never had done before. If McManus can get it close, the receiver core will gobble it up. Talented again are the Seminole pass catchers. Leon High grad Darren Holloman holds down the flanker position and only his second season of college ball. Hassan Jones has spent the last three years playing in the shadows behind Dennis McKinnon, Ouija Thompson, and Jesse Hester. Finally, the senior wideout will have the spotlight all to himself. Now this is his year. Uh, he's going to be in a spotlight. He's the man that we're depending on when it comes to the passing game, and, and hopefully he's learned his lesson well. I think so. You know, I like to go out there and I like to work hard and, you know, do the things that I have to do, and I think I was forced to do that, being that there were a lot of guys here that had been here for a while and that, that were real good when I got here. So, uh, you know, I was forced to work hard, and, you know, that has led on to my senior year, and I've been that way ever since. Greg Allen and Rosie Snipes are gone from the FSU running game, which ranked fifth in the country last season. But this year's group could be better than most folks figure. Experience is the word here at fullback with senior Cletus Jones and at tailback with senior Tony Smith. I know I have some ability. It might not be the, you know, the same as Rosie's or Greg's, mm -hmm. but, you know, to me, I feel like I can get the job done. Because of a training rules violation, Smith has been suspended for the season opener at Tulane. Sophomore redshirt Chuck Wells of Jacksonville will start in his place. How soon will high school All-American Sammy Smith contribute to the FSU running game? That's anyone's guess. The freshman is still rough around the edges, but raw talent may overcome inexperience. The offensive line is a mixture of veterans and rising stars. Pablo Lopez holds down the weak side tackle position. He lines up next to sophomore guard Mark Salva. The center position is held by sophomore Dave Shrinker, a first-year starter. To the strong side is senior tackle John Iannata, a burly, crafty three-year letterman. Next to him, Jamie Dukes, the All-America pulling guard. Considered small by some, Dukes has learned to think on his feet. I realize that I can't go up against a big 300-pounder and, you know, just out-muscle some guy, you know, who was a 6'8", 300-pound gorilla. So what I do, I try to use my brain and, uh, you know, use fundamentals and techniques, things like that, and that usually helps me. Play next to Jamie, uh, you know he's going to get the job done, so it helps you go do your job. Uh, last year was opening game against East Carolina. It was a sweep, and... Uh, I don't think that defensive back is waking up yet. He just really laid him out. I mean, it was a real good block. One of, probably one of the best around we've seen. At tight end, take your pick. Pete Panton, Pat Carter, and Galen White play with equal ability. The kicking game could be one of the best in the country. Placements are handled by Derek Schmidt, who returns from a record-breaking freshman season. Coming into this season, I feel more pressure um, having to do as good or better than last year, and I'm, I'm really hoping for a better year than last year. Junior Lewis Berry is back as starting punter. He's averaged better than 42 yards per kick during his first two seasons. Barry Barco handles the kickoff. So most of the tinkering has taken place. All that's left is for coaches to put the machine on the road and see how it performs. This is Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports. There is a time-honored tradition at Florida State. Each team adopts a new slogan, and they dedicate themselves to it. This year's motto, to find a way. And it couldn't be more appropriate for the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde defense of a year ago. What's the book on the 1985 defensive unit? Well, here's Don Evans. The 1984 football season was like a Charles Dickens novel for Florida State's defense. It was the best of times. From their own 46, Kosar is in trouble. 
Kosar is finally taken down. The stop on the play, Fred Jones. And more often, it was the worst of times, as in the Auburn game, where the Tigers rolled up nearly 600 yards in total offense and 42 points in a wild shootout at Doe Campbell Stadium. And it was this easy for Arizona That's State only side. two weeks later. And uh, Van Rapphorst will throw his first pass of the evening, and it's complete. He's got up to Cox, and Cox is across midfield. All of the That's what hurt us last season. We do really well at one point, then we just lose, you know, just reverse, you know, on, a, on another play. Now the question is, which of those teams will this year's defensive unit be? The one that was dominated or the one that took the pressure off the offense? This year's secondary shapes up like an Agatha Christie novel. Why? Because so far there's so few clues as to how two of the starters will react to the mysteries of the passing game. The partners in crime, sophomore Greg Newell, the starting free safety, who's only playing time with the Seminoles so far has been on the special teams. And and the strong safety is even younger, freshman Stan Shiver, but he brings back memories of one of the best safeties the Knowles have ever had. Keith Jones played in our secondary, he had a great head on him, and he made things happen through his brilliance, his brilliance of mind and his recklessness of body. And Shriver seems to come out of the same mold. Stan's a contact player, he enjoys a game, he enjoys uh, running into people, uh, causing fumbles or whatever. And and I think when you get a guy like that, it has a tendency to become contagious. The two cornerbacks have had only slightly more detective experience. Sophomore Martin Mayhew was a backup at the position last year, and sophomore Eric Williams is the only returning starter. He brings back four interceptions from the 84 season. All that means Andrews will have to author a coaching masterpiece with the secondary. We've got some young guys that have potential to be really fine players. Uh, as quickly as they can grasp what we're doing and, <clears throat> and be able to turn loose and help us in that area. The cookbook for this year's linebacking crew has one main ingredient missing. Inside linebacker Henry Taylor has graduated. He led the team in tackles last year, and the team without him is like apple pie without the filling. Anytime you use, lose a big leader, uh, you not only do you lose a, a, a position in your defense, but you, you know, uh, you get your bell cow, you lose him, and, you know. It's a little bit tough for the hurt. This year's recipe will add a new apple, sophomore Paul McGowan, but Bowden minimizes the drop-off. Uh, he'll find a way to beat you, and uh, I'm very encouraged with him in taking up some of the slack that Henry Taylor left. There is a lot more experience at the other three linebacker positions. The other inside backer will be Big Fred Jones, who used his 242 pounds to finish second behind Taylor in tackles last year. The outside, or crust, if you will, looks even better. Daryl Gray returns at one slot, with Garth Jacks, who started several games last year, returning for his senior year. If it comes down to pure physical skill, there is reason for optimism. Even though we lost Henry Taylor, who was a great leader last year, that will be stronger in the linebacker core this year. We're bigger, we're stronger, and we're faster both inside and outside. Those outside linebackers should see a lot of action this season if the defensive front does its job, which is really very simple. The defensive line, we don't want to give them anything inside, so we're like, really like, walls, you know, just mm -hmm. plugging up the holes. The defensive line, by the way, represents the real book of knowledge for the Seminoles' defense. All three starters are experienced. You'll find Williams, of course, in the W's. He weighs about 260 pounds, and the Seminoles are looking for him to provide the big plays this year. Gerald Nichols will be starting at the other tackle. The St. Louis Jr. has put on 15 pounds and should be stronger than ever. Todd Stroud is expected to play like he may have written the book on the nose guard position. He is small, only 230 35 pounds, but he's also one of the strongest players on the team. These guys are expected to play well most of the time in 85, but so did the 84 team. The difference was a few big plays. If defensively we eliminate the big play, the long run and a long pass, we won five more games. You know, <clears throat> we're in there competing for the national championship and in the Orange Bowl or wherever. The biggest thing is team unity. Uh, we need to all get together and play as 11 people on the, on the team, and uh, I think if we do that, if the linemen play with the backers and the backers play with the secondary, then I think we'll be able to stop the long play. So that's the book on the Florida State defense. Well, not the entire book. Actually, that's only the foreword. There are still at least 11 chapters to be written before this 1985 football season is over. Don Evans, Channel 6, Eyewitness Sports.
If it were somehow possible to channel Bobby Bowden's enthusiasm into that spirit spear over my shoulder, it would blow fuses. He is undeniably cautious and worried about the season ahead, but so too is he fired up. If my fans at Florida State have too high of expectations, a lot of times it is my fault because I have seemed so enthusiastic that they take that, boy, they must be loaded, see? Well, I'm an enthusiastic guy. I've always been that way. I just, I'm, I get, I'm so enthusiastic, I can't hardly hold back. But I don't want to mislead my fans. See, what our fans ha are doing, which is typical, is they've heard so much about our freshmen and what a good class are. They think those kids are going to step right in and do it. Man, you can't believe how bad some of them look. Uh, in drip, but it's not their fault. They still have the ability, they still have the potential, but they run the wrong way. They step with the wrong foot. They put the head on the wrong side. Now, defensively, it wouldn't surprise me if that's not the most improved part of our football team, although we still have liabilities in our secondary because of inexperience. As I watch us as we scrimmage, they'll make good plays, good plays, then they'll blow something and let, let a big one get out of there. And that's typically inexperience. But it wouldn't surprise me if they don't play, if, if they're not the most improved part of a football team. And again, I hope they can get better throughout the season. There will be a different dimension this year, uh, more pocket passing uh, like we did when uh, Jimmy Jordan, Wally Woodham, and uh, that group were here. But uh, still, we're still trying to work under a 50-50 basis of let's try to be able to do one as good as the other. And, and with that schedule there, the fact that, uh, again, that uh, uh, Auburn's been picked number one, Nebraska's been picked number three, and Florida number two at times, uh, still, the two-lane game bothers me more than any of them. Why? Because it's our opener, we don't know what to expect, and law, I'd hate to go to Nebraska 0-1. It's exciting to me. It's adventure at its best. Uh, when the pioneers made their trip from the East Coast trying to get over the mountains, so that's, it's, it's, it's uh, going to be a heck of a battle. We're going to get ambushed. There's going to be war. But I'm excited about it, and my kids are excited about it because there's nothing we can do about it. we got to go. we got to go and play them there. They're doggone right. I'm as excited as I can be. the excitement and the 15-week odyssey for the Seminoles begins here at high noon tomorrow when the Seminoles board this bus and head for New Orleans, Louisiana. Eyewitness Sports will be with the Seminoles every step of the way this season, covering both the good and the bad. Stay with us. In just a moment, we'll be switching you to East Rutherford, New Jersey for the kickoff classic between the BYU Cougars and Boston College Eagles without Doug Flutie. It should be a good game. That's our show for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a good night and a dynamite season. Everybody at the State Seminoles today as they departed for New Orleans and their season opener tomorrow against the Tulane Green Wave. The tribe was dressed to the nines. I mean, they were sporting their new color-coordinated blazers and looking like they just stepped out of the latest edition of GQ. Flying through Hurricane Elena turned out to be no problem for the team as they arrived without a hitch and worked out late this afternoon at the Superdome. The guy feeling the most heat is Danny McManus, who will make his first start tomorrow at quarterback. Right now, just getting the first snap is going to be bothering me the most. First thing I'm going to be thinking about is just getting that snap. After that, after the first snap, everything will be okay. It'll just be just like practice.
The Seminoles go in a solid 11-point favorites, but they better be on their P's and Q's. First-year coach Mac Brown promises a go-go, razzle-dazzle show. I think you'll see us with some reverses and some screens and misdirection, and, and it'll be fun. We'll move around, blitz a little bit on defense, and we're not a great football team. I think everybody understands that, so we've got to pull out all the stops and, and take some chances right now, and, and we'll do that each week. We have been inundated with phone calls today from folks wondering if the FSU Tulane game is still on. The answer, definitely yes. At the moment, and it looks uh, to be a certainty, so is the season opener for the Florida A&M Rattlers tomorrow night against Kentucky State. Offense that made him famous with a new face at the controls, Danny McManus, who has thrown just 16 passes as a Seminole, will get the nod at quarterback against Tulane. There's times that I, I just sit around and just wonder what it's going to be like with 60,000 people watching me play this sport. You know, I got that's 120,000 eyes just looking at me, <laughs> and it's just something that you know, I've really never had done before. Four-year starter Greg Allen is gone at tailback, and so is the projected number one tailback for this season. Tony Smith has been suspended for a week, leaving it up to sophomore Chuck Wells to open at the tailback slot. Defensively, the Seminoles are hoping to take away the thing that Tulane used to beat them in 1983. We had a long run and long pass against us, and, uh, you know, Consequently, we lost a few games from it, and I think one of the major defensive goals is to stop the long play. Even if all that goes well, the head Seminole is worried about one more thing. He doesn't know what to expect from his former assistant coach, Mike Brown. We'll probably be right on 75% of our game plan. The other 25% uh, gives him time to change and do, make adjustments that we didn't know he would, he would do because we hadn't been able to see him play. The U.S. Tennis Open in Flushing Meadow, New York. Flicker away. Return to the site of Sins Pass, the Louisiana Superdome. But today's season opening win over Tulane more than made up for the loss there two years ago. Home team shanked a punt which gave Florida State possession for the first time at Tulane's own 34. And what a day for Danny McManus in his first started quarterback, first play from scrimmage, a sideline rope to Hassan Jones. But Jones would later re-injure his shoulder had to leave the game. The next play from scrimmage, McManus removing all doubt. 15 yards to freshman Phillip Bryan, FSU led 7-0. Surprisingly, Tulane came back with an effective ground game. Rodney Hunter gains 10 yards here. The way Wave rolled downfield about 76 yards worth. Ken Karcher capped it with this flare to Hunter. Greg Newell had a chance, but Hunter goes in. 7-7 seven, seven tie with 544 left in the first. Now the Tribe had trouble holding on to the football in the second quarter. Laid it down twice. Chuck Wells would fumble here on the 11. Cletus Jones later dropped it on the 7. That nixed a couple of scoring opportunities. So Danny McManus says, okay guys, I'll do it myself. 22 yards to Darren Holloman. FSU leads 14 to 7, 309 left in the half. But oh my, a lot can happen in that time. FSU deep in their own territory. Hot potato. Sammy Smith drops it. Watch McManus knocks it out of bounds. Only a two-point safety. FSU's lead trim 14 to 9. Five seconds left in the game. Tulane closed within two points. Wayne Clements, a freshman from Dallas, nails a 51-yarder. 14-12 FSU leads at the half. But the Tribe stormed out of the locker room, scored on their first three opportunities. A 10-play, 71-yard drive capped here by Cletus Jones. 14 yards for the TD. 21-12 FSU, 5-18 to play in the third. A couple of minutes later, Derek Schmidt picked up where he left off last season. A 49-yard field goal gave the Seminoles a 24-12 advantage. To the fourth quarter, FSU's very next possession, fourth and goal. Danny McManus, the option, calls his own number. The sophomore signal caller ran in for yet another TD in the fourth period. He accounted for four touchdowns on the day, two through the air, two on the ground. FSU went on to win it 38-12. to McManus passing for 191 yards. So Bobby Bowden wins his ninth straight season opener at FSU. He's lost only one of those. Former Seminole Mack Brown, he loses in his coaching debut with the Wave. Elsewhere on this first weekend of college football... Am will break open with a flood of games next weekend, but on this first Saturday, just a sprinkling of action, but lots of offense. Start in the Superdome this afternoon, Tulane hosting Bobby Bowden's Florida State Seminoles. His regular quarterback is hurt, but Danny McManus looked first string. Here he finds Phillip Bryant all alone in the end zone. 15-yard score, 7-0 FSU. Seminoles go up 14-7, but plenty of miscues in this first half. This pitch to rookie sensation Sammy Smith is bobbled. Headsy play by McManus forces it out of the end zone for a safety. At the half, his team led by just two, 
They were favored to win this game easily, and McManus made it that way in the second half. Ran in for a couple of scores, threw for another, and McManus contributes four touchdowns in a 38-12 trouncing of Tulane. Talk about wipeouts. South Carolina, a ball game. Bobby Bobby 85 college football season. The Florida State Seminoles are still undefeated. Big winners today over Tulane at the Superdome. Second play of the Seminoles' first drive. Danny McManus fires to freshman Phillip Bryan, 15 yards. Knowles lead 7-0. Tulane returned the favor on their next possession. This pass play here from Ken Carter to Rodney Hunter capped the 76-yard drive. They would tie the game at seven apiece. Now, the Tribe saw a couple of scoring opportunities go up and smoke in the second quarter. Twice the Seminoles fumbled inside the 20. Chuck Wells here on the 11. Cletus Jones later on the seven-yard line. At that time, Danny McManus decided to take matters into his own hand. Here he finds Darren Holloman for a 22-yard TD play. It was 14-7 FSU. Less than a minute left in the first half. Freshman running back Sammy Smith takes the pitch, bobbles it deep in FSU territory. Watch it get knocked out of the end zone for a safety. Add on a two-lane field goal a few seconds later, and FSU had a slim 14-12 lead at the half. But three straight scoring drives out of the locker room put FSU ahead for good. Cletus Jones capped a 71-yard drive with this 14-yard TD run. FSU went on to win the opener, 38-12. Seminoles wasted little time heading back from Louisiana. They boarded a jet, zip right back to Tallahassee. Well, what was on Bobby Bowden's mind? How about those second-quarter fumbles? We fumbled two times inside the 10-yard line going in. That's ridiculous because we, we get nothing. Well, at least we could have got, we've done nothing else. We kicked two field goals and got six, and that was made it precarious. What would you say to him at halftime to turn the second half around? I couldn't quote it on the television. Danny McManus sparkled in his first start at quarterback, 191 yards passing, including a couple of TD areas. Tulane's a fast, uh, fast defense backfield, and they were really worried about uh, probably the deep pass, and our receivers were running great routes. That probably confused them a little bit, and that opened up the corner route, which we ran a lot, which opened up real good. Now, wide right receiver Hassan Jones re-injured his shoulder in today's game. It appears more serious than the injury he sustained during pre-fall. The All-American candidate could be out couple of weeks. The Florida A&M Rattlers opened that for both Tallahassee universities. The Rattlers took a couple of Greyhounds to Jacksonville for their tango with Irk Russell's Georgia Southern Ball Club. And the Seminoles have landed safely in Lincoln where they'll meet a well-prepared bunch of Huskers Saturday afternoon. Drive up, drive up, drive up. Now, the Nebraska Cornhuskers have had plenty of opportunity to watch the Seminoles. You see, they have cable in the football dorm, and last Saturday, all the Huskers were watching FSU Tulane. Oh, they look pretty good on their passing, and they had some good receivers. They had one go down, I believe. He might not play against us. That might hurt them a little bit. But they threw well, and they also ran the ball well. we got to stop the running game before we even think about the passing game. It's the first half. They look like a, a team that, you know, is playing their first game, and I hope we don't start out that way. But uh, uh, I think as they came on in the second half, they really showed their power. So uh, they're going to score 35 points a game. If they're going to get 35 against us, we could have a problem. The a test for Florida State comes down tomorrow on the Great Plains in Nebraska. The Tribe hit the road for Lincoln this afternoon for the national TV date against those mighty Huskers. The Seminoles are returning to the site of what many consider to be the greatest victory in the school's history. A stunning 18-14 win over the Huskers back in 1980. It's the greatest that I have been associated with in Florida State. We've had some pretty big wins here too, but that's, that'll all, that's my favorite right now. And uh, because uh, at the time, it just didn't seem uh, practical that, that it would happen. Despite an 18 to 14 lead, things looked unpractical for FSU right up to the very end. The Huskers were working one of their patented drives with less than a minute to play. It was actually desperation on our part. We knew they had to score. Uh, we knew they had the potential to score at any given moment on us. With 11 seconds remaining, Nebraska on the FSU three, linebacker Paul Purowski forced Jeff Quinn to fumble. Futch pounced on the football to preserve the Seminoles' greatest win ever. There were several of us around. Uh, I remember at the bottom of the pile, Reggie Herring nearly beat me to death trying to get the ball. Uh, so I think we'd have had it no matter who had it at the end. But October 4, 1980 is a far cry away from Saturday's date with the Huskers. In more ways than one, this will be a whole new ball game. Nebraska's starting a lot of new faces this year. 
And uh, well, all we know is they're going to be doggone good football players. The Seminoles will march as underdogs onto the fabled surface of Memorial Stadium. At times, Bobby Bowden has given the impression that he'd just as soon stay home while the others make the trip. However... I'll be honest with you, I love it. As simple as I can say it, I can't wait. Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports at Florida State. John said it was abbreviated. He wasn't kidding. That's sports. Okay, John. 20 fly Good evening, everybody. At Eyewitness Sports, our job is to stay on top of the story to give you tomorrow's headlines today. So here we go. FSU shucks Huskers. Actually, that's a Tallahassee Democrat headline from five years ago when Florida State pulled off what many consider to be their greatest win ever, beating Nebraska at their place in Lincoln. Well, the tribe returned to the scene of that crime today with visions of yet another miracle dancing in their heads. It's the greatest that I have been associated with in Florida State. We've had some pretty big wins here, too. But that's, that'll all, that's my favorite right now. And uh, because uh, at the time, it just didn't seem uh, practical that, that it would happen. Despite an 18-14 lead, things looked unpractical for FSU right up to the very end. The Huskers were working one of their patented drives with less than a minute to play. It was actually desperation on our part. We knew they had to score. Uh, we knew they had the potential to score at any given moment on us. With 11 seconds remaining, Nebraska on the FSU three, linebacker Paul Purowski forced Jeff Quinn to fumble. Futch pounced on the football to preserve the Seminoles' greatest win ever. There were several of us around. Uh, I remember at the bottom of the pile, Reggie Herring nearly beat me to death trying to get the ball. Uh, so I think we'd have had it no matter who had it at the end. But October 4, 1980 is a far cry away from Saturday's date with the Huskers. In more ways than one, this will be a whole new ball game. Nebraska's starting a lot of new faces this year. And uh, well, all we know is they're going to be doggone good football players. The Seminoles will march as underdogs onto the fabled surface of Memorial Stadium. At times, Bobby Bowden has given the impression that he'd just as soon stay home while the others make the trip. However... I'll be honest with you, I love it. As simple as I can say it, I can't wait. Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports at Florida State. Oh, he has a gleam in his eye. Kickoff is set for 3.50 tomorrow afternoon. Nebraska comes in a solid eight-point favorite. When the Seminoles and Huskers put the finishing touches on things out in Lincoln... ...ranked teams has number 15, Florida State, at number 8, Nebraska. The Cornhuskers have finished in the top 10 in each of Tom Osborne's 12 years. The Seminoles, meanwhile, have climbed from the bottom under coach Bobby Bowden. Don't let me look at that film uh, tomorrow and, and, and you come tell me I was tired, coach. Get out of the football game if you're tired. We'll put somebody out here do good, too. Bobby Bowden is now in his 20th year as a head coach, his 10th at Florida State. At West Virginia, all Bowden heard was beat Pitt. As an assistant at Alabama, it was beat Auburn. When he arrived at the Florida State campus in 1976, it was beat anybody. Bowden inherited a team that was a perennial loser. But within his first season, the Seminoles were consistent winners. Last season, Florida State tied Georgia in the Citrus Bowl. It was the Seminoles' sixth bowl bid in Bowden's nine years. Highlighting the span are back-to-back -back Orange Bowl appearances in 1979 and 1980, when the Seminoles earned the respect of the nation's powers. The greatest accomplishment that we have had at Florida State since I've been there is when we played Nebraska at Nebraska in 1980, and they were number two in the nation, and we beat them. Then the next week, we come home and play Pittsburgh, who, in the 10 years I've been there, is the best football team we've played since I've been at Florida State. Pitt, 1980, check them out. 17 drafts, 17 kids drafted off that squad. But beating Nebraska, number two in the nation. Then the next week, Pitt went up to number two, and we knocked them off. And then we became number two. So that's, I think that's the best two-night stand we've made. But many feel the best is yet to come. All-American running back Sammy Smith of Apopka, Florida, is the cream of what football news calls the finest recruiting crop in the nation. If he and one or two of his teammates can make an impact as freshmen, this could be the year that Florida State wins it all. Ninth-ranked Southern Meth... They say a team shows its most improvement between its first and second games of the year. If that's the case, Florida State should have a major edge against Nebraska. Seminoles routed Tulane 38-12 after turning the ball over three times in the first half. Nebraska, meanwhile, takes the field for the first time. And with only four starters from a year ago, this is an inexperienced team. 
look for Florida State to pull the upset. What else does Brigham Young have a matchup of two top 20 teams. The Cornhuskers come into this, their opening game against the Seminoles of Florida State, who won their opener last Saturday over the Green Wave of Tulane. And number 10 from the Seminoles upset Nebraska at Nebraska, 17-13. Quickly, let's take a look at what happened in the football game. This was an early touchdown, 60-yard run by Nebraska fullback Tom Rackman, which put the Cornhuskers on top 7 to nothing. In the Nebraska running game, appeared early in the ball game to be capable of dominating Florida State. But Florida State quarterback Danny McManus had an excellent day before being injured. This pass to Darren Holloman for a touchdown tied the game at 7-7. Still in the first quarter, Nebraska came back after McCaffrey Clayton was put in at tailback or at quarterback. He pitched to Doug Dubose. That put the Huskers on top 13-10 after a Florida State field goal. And then Florida State was able to come back, McManus giving off running back going into the end zone. That put Florida State ahead 17-13. Doug Flutie, Nebraska lives by the run. Today they died by the run. They ran the ball extremely well. The fourth quarter, Nebraska had driven inside the Florida State 10-yard line. Rathlin, who scored the first Nebraska touchdown, breaking off tackle, trying to get into the end zone. The big stick and the ball came loose. It was recovered by Tom Shiver of Florida State. Ultimately, that defensive play, which kept Nebraska out of the end zone, became the difference in the football game. Southern Cal and Illinois, very significant game for both teams ranked in the matchup of 10. two top 20 teams occurred in Lincoln, Nebraska, and Florida State has this penchant for rising to the occasion when they are a underdog on the road. Now, you go into Lincoln, you figure, well, no matter who's playing Nebraska, they're going to be the underdog, but Florida State says, we love this situation. And once again, it was the Seminoles who pulled off the upset, winning 17-13. Tom Rathman handoff going 55 yards early, though, for Nebraska. Didn't look so good in the first quarter for Florida State because the Huskers led it 7-0. But here comes Florida State right down the field. Sophomore quarterback Don McManus to Darren Holloman. Slant pattern, 15-yard TD. We are tied at 7. Nebraska gambling fourth and one. The pitch out to Doug DeBose. The gamble works because the Huskers lead at 13-10 in the second quarter. The big play of the game. The bad snap. Dan Wingard can't even get the punt off. He is snowed under by Florida State. Help setting up a three-yard run by fullback Cletus Jones. Blast in for the Seminoles. 17-13 lead. Fourth quarter now. Nebraska. Time running out fourth and six. Dan Turner back to pass. Uh, no, the pass hits his offensive lineman in the head. Needless to say, it was incomplete. Florida State pulls off the upset at Nebraska, winning today by a score of 17 to 13. Another intriguing matchup this one. Saturday. For the first time in five years, the Nebraska Cornhuskers don't appear to have the guns to challenge for the national title. Not only does Nebraska have to replace nearly all the starters from last year's third-ranked team, but Tom Osborne saw Florida State. On the schedule to open the year, the Seminoles rolled into Lincoln with a chance to grab some glory and didn't bat an eye. 130 degrees on the field at Nebraska. It was that hot. Fourth play of the game, the Huskers started off with a bang. Tom Rathman ripped it right up the middle, untouched, went 55 yards. Nebraska led 7-0, and Husker fans said, oh, we might be that good. Florida State said, oh, no, you're not. Danny McManus led him right back down the field. Florida State's first possession, little bump in the backfield, but Darren Holloman hauls it in, wide open, touchdown, 7-7. Looked like it'd be an offensive show. But then mistakes cost the Huskers. Actually, the punter was down. Dan Winger couldn't get the punt off. Florida State nailed him at the six, and a couple plays later was in for the touchdown. A three-yard run by Cletus Jones put the Seminoles up 17-13 right before the first half ended. That's how the game ended. These two offensive powers went into, like, hibernation in the second half. Nebraska had one last chance on fourth and six, but quarterback Travis Turner hit the helmet of an offensive lineman with a pass. It bounced harmlessly to the turf, and for the second time in their last three trips to Nebraska, Florida State has pulled a four-point upset of the, of the Huskers. So Nebraska and Maryland, seven and eight, both lose at home, opening day. Meanwhile, number 12, Illinois everybody, Bobby Bowden likes Nebraska, and Nebraska went out of its way today to make the Florida State coach and the team feel right at home. Playing in Florida swamp-like conditions of high humidity and temperatures exceeding 100 degrees, the Cornhuskers committed football suicide in the second half as a 13th-ranked try pulled off another one of their patented upsets. You know, in many respects, today's four-point victory was similar to the four-point win the Seminoles pulled off back in 1980. Mark Feinberg has the story. Who says lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place? The greatest win, part two, happened this afternoon in Lincoln, Nebraska, with the Seminoles showing a national television audience they were for real. Nebraska started the scoring off with a nonchalant 60-yard run by fullback Tom Rathman. 
Cornhusker shucked the Knoll defense up the middle for the 7 0 lead. The Tribe came right back and proved their worth with a 14 play drive, which ended when the diminutive Derek Holloman made a big catch from 16 yards out from Danny McManus to make it 7 all. The Big Red Machine made a big mistake during a punt attempt, and the Knolls were able to get three points out of it when Derek Schmidt nailed this 20 yarder for a 10 to 7 Seminole advantage. Second quarter and Nebraska goes back on top thanks to the power of Doug DuBose as he takes it in from the one on fourth down. Put the score at 13 to 10 Nebraska. The final score of the game came when Cletus Jones took the ball at the two yard line whirling his body into the end zone for a 17 to 13 halftime score. But that would be all in the scoring department but it wasn't the end of the game. The second half was a comedy of errors for Nebraska as the Knowles defense bent to the limit but did not break. The good fortune went Florida State's way as Nebraska fumbled at the FSU 8 to begin the fourth quarter. Danny McManus was then sent to La La Land in the next series, and Kurt Coker was sent in to man the boat the rest of the way. Nebraska had a chance to pull within one, but they missed the easy chip shot. Then the final blow was struck when linebacker Paul McGowan intercepted. The Knowles sat on the ball the rest of the way for their second win in Lincoln in three tries. Mark Feinberg, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports, Tallahassee. Thank you, Week is by Bobby Bowden's Florida State Seminoles. They took advantage of numerous Nebraska turnovers to upset the Cornhuskers 17 to 13, and the loss drops Nebraska out of the 12 pack. Southern Methodists fall is out and the Seminoles are up there in the... Good evening, everyone. The United Press International coaches have spoken and Florida State fans will want to listen. I'll begin at the top, but I know your eyes will first fall to the bottom of the page. The first five begins with Oklahoma and ends with the Seminoles, Florida State jumping to number five. The Sooners will still hold down the number one spot despite the fact they have yet to play and will not play until three weeks from now. Oklahoma edges out Auburn for first place by just two votes. Southern Cal checks in at number three with five first place tallies. Then Ohio State with one. Florida State also received a first place vote. You can bet that nod came from Nebraska coach Tom Osborne. Now this number five ranking is the highest for the Seminoles since the 1979 Orange Bowl season when the Tribe spent some time in the number two spot. The Knolls with the greatest movement among this week's top 20, jumping a total of eight spots after that big win on Saturday over the Cornhuskers. Number six through 10 looking like this. Oklahoma State followed by Iowa, UCLA, and then the come from behind Penn State Nittany Lions, Bill Orange Sparkers, LSU Tigers in at number 10. South Carolina jumped seven places, moving to number 11. They're tied this week with the Fighting Irish. Brigham Young is number 13, followed by the Huskers, who dropped 10 places after the loss. Arkansas is number 15. Final five, Bama, West Virginia, Maryland, Pitt, and then rounded out by Texas. The Seminoles now have a couple of weeks to savor their lofty status. An open date is on tap for this Saturday. The Knowles will return to action on the 21st when they host Memphis State. Meantime, they'll just be resting their bones. A lot of ankle sprains and knee bruises and uh, bruised shoulders and busted hands. And uh, thank goodness nothing is major, but uh, a week to get these things well will definitely help us a lot. In response to the upcoming home season, FSU officials Everyone, yesterday, you Campbell Stadium, nine months and some change of waiting for Seminole football fans who finally come to an end as the home opener for Florida State kicks off at 12.15 before the cameras of a national television audience. The Memphis State Tigers come to town toting an undefeated 1-0-2 record. That's right, two ties in three weeks of ball. The Seminoles know all about tying the Tigers. They only have to think back to a year ago. Year we were undefeated, 4-0, and, and went up there and should have lost the game, but we pulled it out, pulled out a tie at the last. So those seniors hadn't forgot that. The youngsters, a lot of them hadn't been through it yet, but I hope that our seniors will continue to remind them. We know it's like a payback for us. we got to try and get back and get Memphis State back for what they did to us last year. But they got the same team, so we're in for a dogfight again this week. And the Florida A&M. Florida State is good. yet to lose. The sixth-ranked Seminoles are 2-0. and oh. Memphis State has just one win, but the Tigers have also yet to lose. We need to win, win the football game, and they do too. They haven't lost one this year, although they have two ties, and we haven't lost one, so one of us are fixing to get it this week. Oklahoma State almost got it last week. The Florida State had to rely on kicker Derek Schmidt's last-second field goal to tie Memphis State, and today... Seminoles coach Bobby Bowden figured he might as well go back to the well. Schmidt responded with four field goals, three of the long variety, as Florida State won at home 19-10. But it was the Cousins at Memphis State that got the Tigers off to smell an upset. Quarterback Danny Sparkman to cousin Ricky Sparkman in the flats scored an eight-yard TD. Memphis State would lead it 10-0. 
But in the second quarter, it's a 10-3 game following the kickoff by the Seminoles. Jerry Harris fumbles. Martin McHugh recovers for Florida State on the ensuing drive. They felt they were in business until number 53, Marlon Brown, bears down on Danny McManus. McManus knocked unconscious, left the game. He's okay, but did not play from then on. Seminoles kept driving. A penalty negated a 46-yard field goal. No problem. Derek Schmidt, 2-for-2 two two on 51-yard field goals. 10-6, Memphis State at the half. Third quarter, Florida State on the drive. Backup quarterback Kirk Coker connects with Darren Holm. A nice catch in the corner of the end zone. 13-10, the Seminoles. The touchdown was the game winner, but Schmidt kept on kicking. He had two second-half field goals as well. And the defense shut down Memphis State. So, Florida State gets the win at home. Uh, upping their mark now to 3-0 on the young year, and they beat Memphis State by a score of 19-10. to Elsewhere, as some other top 20... Upcoming... ...in full, but not too far from it. The Tigers score on the first possession. Here's quarterback Danny Sparkman. He finds first cousin Ricky Sparkman, 7-zip Memphis State. Bobby says, what in the heck happened there? Florida State offense couldn't get on track. Here, McManus overthrows tight end Pat Carter. Memphis State coach Ray Dempsey indicates he'd like three more points. So kicker Don Glasson obliges from 52, yard, 52 yards out, 10 zip Tigers early in the second quarter. Then, inside of five minutes and a half, McManus finds, guess who? Hassan, he definitely won't play Jones for a big first down, leading to another 52-yard boot, this time by Derek Schmidt. Three points for the good guys. Now, here comes a nice play. Watch this. Ensuing kickoff, Speedy Jerry Harris has the ball stripped by Bruce Heggie, and the Knowles recover at the 27. Now comes one of the hardest hits you're ever going to see. Danny McManus simply gets crushed by Marlon Brown. Never saw him coming. He was 5 for 15, 67 yards for the day. Knowles get three more. Well, a less than spectacular first half for the Seminoles, but as you can see, they're coming out fired up for the third period. Team of Memphis State. Hooker, good protection, plenty of time. There's Holloman. We, we talked about it all week about we looking our receivers off to one side and throwing to the other. And I kind of looked at Hassan and on my hit my fifth step, I looked and I looked back and uh, there was Darren. He was wide open. He made a great move on the cornerback and did a great job. Pressure. It's picked up. Number 26 is Alfonso Williams. Came up the middle by 38, Paul McGowan. And the year, actually five out of five. Okay, now <laughs> Memphis State gave him the ball right back. Schmidt gets another field goal. Final. Florida State, 19, Memphis State can't handle it. Ten. Behind Derek Schmidt's field goal kicking, Florida State rallied for a win over Memphis State in college football on Saturday afternoon. The final was 19-10, FSU with the victory. Some highlights of exactly how this one happened. Memphis State surprises everybody in Tallahassee. Tigers quarterback Danny Sparkman finds his cousin Ricky for an eight-yard score. 7-0 MSU, they built a 10-0 lead. Second quarter, Seminoles kickoff following a field goal. Harris is hit. He fumbles. Martin Mayhew recovers for FSU. On the ensuing drive, Danny McManus will drop back to pass. He's just laid out by number 53, Marlon Brown. McManus knocked unconscious, left the game, but he is okay from what we understand from the school. Seminoles kept driving, and after a penalty negated a 45-yard field goal, Derek Schmidt steps up five yards farther, 51 yards. 10-6, Memphis State at the half. Third quarter, FSU drives. Kirk Coker replacing McManus, connects with Darren Holloman. 13 yards worth of score. It's 13-10, the Seminoles with the lead. The TD was the game winner. It was Derek Schmidt's foot that also was part of the gamer. He connected for two field goals in the second half. Four in all, scoring 12 of FSU's 19 points. Doak Campbell Stadium in cars, vans, and campers before 10 this morning. Fans gathered for a pregame celebration in the parking lot. Despite the overcast sky and early hour, fans picnicked with some elaborate luncheons and cooked out. Some opted to have breakfast instead. It was so early. Although fans are used to a late afternoon game, most said it wouldn't matter what time the game starts. They'd be out in full force to cheer the players on. And Scott Atwell, they had a reason to cheer today. They certainly did. No matter how you stack it up, the Seminoles are 3-0 with a nine-point victory today over the Memphis State Tigers. And in baseball, the doctor of the evening, everybody, if it were a painting, it would be no Picasso. But as they say, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. And as far as Seminole fans are concerned, any win is a beautiful win. Bob Warren colors in Florida State's victory this afternoon over Memphis State. For a very long while today, you could have colored this picture blue and white from the palette of Memphis State. 
Florida State in its home opener looked more like Salvador Dali's drop cloth, anything but the garnet and gold powerhouse we saw against Nebraska a couple of weeks ago. The Tigers came out of the block smoking. In fact, on their initial possession, they zoomed down the field like they were on their way to a fire. While well, all the while, the FSU defense looked as if it were sleepwalking. 12 plays, 85 yards, and five and a half minutes after the opening bell, the firm of Sparkman and Sparkman opened for business. Quarterback Daddy Sparkman caught Florida State in a safety blitz on a naked bootleg, and he hit his cousin, Ricky Sparkman, with this eight-yard touchdown toss, and that put the Tigers up seven to nothing. And that was all the scoring there was in the opening quarter. The second period opened with a bang, though. It came off the foot of Memphis State's Dan Glossman, who hit this long-distance 52-yard field goal, and the Tigers had Florida State squarely by the tail, leading 10 to nothing. The Seminoles finally showed a little spark of their own, and it was provided by an old friend, Wide receiver Hassan Jones, out for the past couple of games with a shoulder separation and not expected to play, did. Pulling in this 24-yard toss from Danny McManus to set up the first of many Derek Schmidt field goals. His 51-yarder was true, and the try was on the board at 10-3. On the ensuing kickoff, lightning struck. Jerry Harris, one of the best return men in the business, took off on what looked to be big trouble. But Bruce Hagee cut in front, looked the gift horse in the mouth, put a mitt on the ball, and stripped it. Martin Mayhew recovered, and the Seminoles were knocking on the door again. Unfortunately for Danny McManus, it was Memphis State linebacker Marlon Brown who came a-calling with a vicious blindside hit, snapping McManus's head like a rag doll, knocking him out for a full minute. Doctors rushed the sophomore into the locker room, where he was diagnosed as having a concussion and a very sore neck. With the leader gone, the drive stalled, and Eric Schmidt added three more points on the board with his second 51-yarder. As the first half ended, it was Memphis State that looked to be the sixth-ranked team of the country. Florida State, a team in search of itself, having been shut out for the first 28 minutes, 26 seconds of the first half, before Derek Schmidt's foot swung into action, making the halftime score Memphis State 10, Florida State 6. But in the second half, Florida State came to play. The defensive unit pulled the plug on the Tigers, allowing nothing. And the offense finally took control. Reserve quarterback Kirk Coker made it happen. Watch as he looks off Hassan Jones in the corner, then turns and fires to Darren Holloman on the short corner out for the touchdown. And I dropped back and looked at Hassan and then went back over and threw to Darren. And I think look, look, looking him off is what, is what made the play. Derek Schmidt then completed the scoring with his third and fourth field goals of the afternoon to make the final Florida State 19, Memphis State 10. The head man was not impressed. The way they abused our offensive line and our backs that were trying to protect our pass. They, they totally abused them. Yes, they totally abused us. As I was saying, the head man is not happy. I, I wouldn't be surprised if a little personnel changes this week. I mean, I've got a couple guys I'm going to look at pretty hard. If they ain't getting the job done, we'll find somebody else. Bob Warren, Channel 6, Eyewitness Sports, Tallahassee. Thank you, Bob. The Florida A&M Rattlers were in room. My sweet head, I've always been so glad to be with you. Is on once again at Florida State, where the Seminoles are busy preparing for Saturday's date with the 20th ranked and undefeated Kansas Jayhawks. We mean literal heat. Mother Nature favors not America's fourth ranked team as the Seminoles labor away under hot, humid conditions. Quarterback Danny McManus is still an observer at practice as the sophomore signal caller works out the cobwebs from a vicious knockout blow he suffered over the weekend. Kirk Coker and Chip Ferguson are the numbers one and two at the moment. Now when those pass-happy Jayhawks come out gunning on Saturday, the pressure will squarely be on the FSU secondary. And the newest member of the starters, Deion Sanders. As Scott Atwell now tells us, this true uh, freshman is no flash in the pan. In the galaxy of Florida State's freshman stars, he is the most luminous. The only rookie to start for these fourth-ranked Seminoles, Deion Sanders has been fired upon early, but so far he has put on a gold star performance. He knows being a freshman he's going to be tested. He's going to be picked on a little bit when he's there. And uh, so far he's, uh, you know, he's, he's made the play when he had to make it. Last year when I quarterback in high school, we had a weak spot out there on defense. I would throw to that spot, and they consider me the weak spot now. But in games to come, and you know, with them watching, I don't think I'll be a weak spot from now on. An all-purpose man by trade, Sanders also handles Florida State's punt returns. He's daring, exciting, 
And last weekend against Memphis State, he was a man with a mission. I wanted to score. I want to score bad. I mean, real bad, because my parents was at the game. And I just really wanted to score and get in the end zone. With his early success as a freshman starter, folks already are comparing Deion Sanders with some of the all-time greats here at Florida State, including Bobby Butler. I don't want them to really compare me to him, because... If I make a mistake or something, old Bobby wouldn't have made that mistake when he's really not a Bobby Butler. I just want to go out there and be myself and make it on my own. Deion Sanders is not short on confidence or, as you've seen, ability. The only thing standing in his way is time. Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports at Florida State. Now, Florida A&M continues to state, if you do, duck. Danny Mac has been attacked and brutalized the last two games, and it's left folks, particularly offensive linemen, in a touchy mood. The hit McManus took in last weekend's Memphis State game has now proved to be costly and very frustrating, as Bobby Bowden alluded to last weekend. You can't protect your passer. You can forget the passing game. You just forget all about it. I couldn't believe the way they abused our offensive line and our backs that were trying to protect our pass. They, they totally abused us. More specifically, the Tigers abused quarterback Danny McManus, who fell to a KO sack late in the second quarter. It was the second game in a row for the sophomore quarterback, who was knocked out of the Nebraska game two weeks earlier. If it were one person, you know, Coach Bowden or Coach McDuffie, you know, they could do something about it, but, you know, it's everybody, you know. One play, I'll make a mistake. Next play, Hassan makes a mistake, and John Ayanada makes a mistake, and Pablo Lopez makes a mistake, and it goes on and on. So it's not just one person. And it may not be just the offensive line. Ironically, McManus may be his own worst enemy. I admire him because of his willingness to stand in there under pressure. Most, kid, most quarterbacks will flush. You can flush him out of there, you know, and uh, he won't flush that easy. Of course, that was before the two knockouts, and folks would be hard-pressed to blame the sophomore quarterback if he softened up in the pocket. I don't know if I'll get gunshot I'll have to wait and see to the game, you know, but... That's part of the game. You're going to get hit back there. Just, you know, I just happen to get hit twice harder than anyone probably would imagine. For now, McManus won't have to worry about getting hit. Kirk Coker has drawn the starting assignment for Saturday's game against Kansas. Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports at Florida State. Thank you, Scotty. Now, a little home cooking for the Florida a Put the clamps on quarterback Mike Norseth. Now, how are they planning to do it? Well, here's a few ideas. Check out the position of the defensive back in this film. He's been badly beaten, another victim of Air Norseth. Kansas quarterback Mike, so good he could make the best cornerman look like Pee Wee Herman. There's no doubt about it. He's a, he's a very gifted individual. He understands his offense very well, and uh, he's done a great job so far. This Saturday, North Seth, a senior, will face a seminal secondary comprised of two freshmen and two sophomores. Talented experience versus talented inexperience. A mismatch that calls for a solid game plan. Tested very thoroughly. The thing that we've tried to do is be sound in our coverage, work on our uh, individual techniques, our assignments, and whatever. And, Make sure we're in the right place when the ball turns over. Dion, Norseth's thrown 153 passes without an interception. Is that going to come to a halt on Saturday? I really do think so. He's going to be putting it up. And I think I might be the one who stopped that streak there. Get your first interception in major college. Yes, and try to take it back, hopefully. Now, of course, the members of the Seminoles secondary aren't the only ones with a little home cooking. Highlight from Florida State's game tonight, as well as the family Rattlers. Stick around. Sports, come on your way next. Hey everybody, the fourth-ranked Florida State Seminoles are undefeated. The Tribe came from behind for a victory tonight over Kansas. And Bob Warren is standing by live at Doe Campbell Stadium for a game report. Robert? Thank you, Scotty. Hello, everybody. Let me tell you from the outset, never believe what a sportscaster tells you. Five weeks ago, we did a Florida State preseason show. At that time, looking at the schedule, I said, no sweat. When Kansas comes to town, it would be a piece of cake. The Jayhawks were nothing more than weak sisters. Never believe what a sportscaster tells you. Believe me. 57,135 poured into Doe Campbell Stadium tonight on just a perfect night. And I think everybody in the place will tell you they certainly got their money's worth and even a little more as we take a look at the highlights right now. Kansas got the ball first and they moved down the field like they absolutely own the place. Harold at quarterback Mike North set hooked up with Sandy McGee from 25 yards and the Hawks were already knocking on the door down to the seven yard line. On the very next play it was North set with the magic to tie it in Sylvester Bird and seven yards 
yards out, 7-0 Kansas. Then it became the turnover bowl. Florida State on its initial possession drove all the way downfield, came within inches of scoring. But Cletus Jones struggling to get in, fumble before breaking the plane. KU then turned the ball back over to Florida State but the Tribe immediately returned the favor. Check it out. Kurt Coker is picked off by John Randolph at the FSU's 19. And folks, that led to some points. The Drive stalled, but Jeff Johnson did the honors. With this 26-yard field goal, 10 to nothing, Kansas. Florida State came running right back on the wheels of Tony Smith, 98 yards in the first half alone, all the way down to the three-yard line here, a 23-yard gain. The Drive bogged down, and Derek Schmidt did the honors from uh, 18 yards out. It was 10-3, Kansas. On FSU's next possession, the firm of Coker to Bryant went to work. Coker hits the Bainbridge native for a 17-yard pickup across the middle. Then on the very next play, Coker to Bryant again from 21 yards out for the touch, and we had a 10-all tie. Then Florida State committed a cardinal sin, roughing the Kansas punter on fourth down, and the Hawks were alive at the 38-yard line. North set cashed in with a butte. Check this out. He connects with Willie Vaughn for a 21-yard touchdown. Kansas had a 17-10 halftime lead. Only points in the third quarter right here off the foot of Johnson, 20 to uh, 10, Kansas. In the fourth quarter, Bobby Bowden got a hook and a hero was born. Check out Chip Ferguson as he hooks up with freshman Philip Bryant with a 68-yard bomb and the lead was cut to 2017 Kansas and the joint was rocking. Just two minutes and 25 seconds later, more fireworks from yet another freshman. Victor Floyd scoots in from six yards out. It was 24 to 20 Florida State, their first lead of the night. Kansas got one final chance to pull it out. We're moving, but North set. It's Eric Williams who intercepts, and that preserved the tough 24 to 21 for the fourth ranked tri tribe. Now, following the game, we hustle on down to the locker room to get reaction from the principals involved. The first man we spoke to, a relieved Bobby Bowden. But we kept saying, you know, we we were then through the the thing we were kept telling ourselves, let's don't panic yet. You know, we knew we knew things would panic any minute, but let's don't panic yet. We were then three. We were then seven. We were within three, we were within seven, then all of a sudden we were within ten. And uh, so we put Chip in there. We felt like something had to happen, and he did a real good job. It's a team sport, and we needed something else. You know, I, I know that Chip came in there and did the job. I just wish that we'd have called that play while I was in there. I think we'd have scored, but we just, we never, like I said, we never called it while I was in there. It's been close all year, and, you know, it's just been, you know, small things that's been separating them. And I don't know if today's game would really determine, you know, who would be the starting quarterback against, against Auburn, but whichever quarterback's in, I hope they do a good job and help us win. Okay. Scotty, let me wrap it up from Doe Campbell Stadium Live tonight by telling you no major injuries that we know of, first of all. A new star is born in Chip Ferguson, the freshman, and Florida State now gets a week off to prepare for the Auburn Tigers, and I know you have more about them and their fortunes today. I didn't need Bobby. Oh. Bobby tells it like it is. Bert tells it like it was. And the Seminoles had all the excitement you ever wanted to see, and then some. Make a date with Bobby and Bert and Florida State. Sundays this fall on the Bobby Bowden Show. It's something special. See the Bobby Bowden Show Sunday at noon and 11.30 on Channel 6. Man wastes little time. He spies former Seminole Dennis McKinnon. The Bears roll over Washington 45-10. You may recall Packers quarterback Lynn Dick. Led by Bobby Bowden before the season began. I asked him which game he thought would be the key to a successful season. Oddly enough, it was not Nebraska, Miami, or Florida. Without hesitation, he said it would be Auburn. Well, the time has come to spit the bit as the undefeated and fourth-ranked Seminoles try to travel to Tigerland. The tribe will need a win, but as we hear from Scott Atwell, in Auburn, history is not on their side. Auburn, Alabama, the loveliest village on the plains. The Seminoles haven't done very well here in the loveliest village. Plain truth is, Florida State hasn't done very well against Auburn at all. In 13 tries, the Seminoles have beaten the Tigers only once. We haven't beaten Auburn since uh, the earth was created at Auburn. Never. Not even in the history books. The Auburn jinx, and it would not be unfair to call it that, began in 1954, but it's been most evident the last two seasons. 1983, Jordan Hare Stadium. Auburn takes a three-point lead with just over a minute to play. FSU's ensuing drive is just shy of field goal range when Kelly Lowry is intercepted. Auburn wins 
1984 Doak Campbell Stadium, the now infamous Tiger Bounce. Ed Graham gathers in a bobbled kick return and rambles 60 yards for the touchdown. Later, the Seminoles would lose 42 to 41 in one of the wildest shootouts ever. I think that's really just a coincidence because, uh, you know, Florida State's, you know, they're a great team. And uh, we've just, uh, last two years, we've really just, uh, you know, kind of slipped by them both years. So, uh, uh -huh. and that'll probably be an extra, you know, added, added incentive for them. So. Coach Bowden said, you know, they've, they've been leading 59 minutes. And then the 60th, you know, they come, Auburn comes back and beat them. But he wants to win all 60 minutes Saturday. The Seminoles had better get used to the idea of playing the Auburn Tigers in one way or another, learning how to beat them. Between now and 1999, the two schools will face each other 11 more times. Scott Atwell, Channel 6 Eyewitness Sports, Auburn, Alabama. Thank you, Scotty. Tomorrow night. Scoring a fair against 13th ranked Auburn. The Tigers are led by running back Bo Jackson, who in four games has 815 yards and eight touchdowns and is the nation's leading scorer. You can't stop him. You just have to try to slow him down. If you had a poor offensive line, you could try to get to him before he got started. But they have an outstanding offensive line to go with him. They have a very good uh, complementary part to his uh, staff. And, uh, but you, it's, it's not trying to stop him. It's trying to slow the guy down, you know, where he can't get the big one on you. Auburn has dominated this series 11-1-1, but the last two have been extremely close. When Alabama and Penn State meet, Auburn has lost just one of its previous 13 meetings with Florida State, winning the last two in the final minutes. But this year, Florida State has the better team. Auburn has the home field advantage, but after winning already at Nebraska, Florida State will not be intimidated. And that game will be televised by WTBS coming up in about 30 minutes. Also tonight on TBS, it's Army and Boston College. Florida State fell to Auburn, 59-27. Bo Jackson on the day, 30 carries, 176 yards and two touchdowns. If you've been with us all day, you know that Jackson has now rushed for 991 yards in five games. He fell nine yards short of joining Marcus Allen's the only two men ever to gain 1,000 in the first five games of a season. San Diego 27 victory over Florida State today. Of course, you see the big four next to Florida State as the Seminoles travel to Auburn unbeaten and untied for the season and hoping to preserve their top 10 ranking and a chance for the national championship. But it was another big day for Bo Jackson, who's had only one bad one this year. That, of course, the loss to Tennessee. In the first quarter, Jackson gave the Plainsmen of Auburn a 7-0 lead on this 53-yard touchdown run. And you can see there the agility as well as the speed as he made that cut at the 10-yard line to get in and make it 7-0. But Florida State came back to take the lead in the football game, tying it up first on a Darren Holloman touchdown run on a reverse. And then this Auburn pass was intercepted. Eric Williams took it in from 17 yards out. At that point, Florida State led 14-7. It was 17-17 at one point. Fullwood broke the tie early in the third quarter to make it 24-17 Auburn. And then Bo Jackson again, this time a 35-yard touchdown run as Jackson made it in to give Auburn a 31-17 lead. From that point, with Florida State having to throw the football, it became a debacle as shortly, Wigan got a touchdown run for Auburn to make it 38-27 after the Florida State field goal. Then Kevin Porter got this interception, went 33 yards to make it 45-27 Auburn. And there's a shot of Bo Jackson who finished the day with 30 carries for 176 yards, two touchdowns, and we remind you of the statistic Jackson had a chance to become only the second man in college football history to rush for 5,000 yards, or excuse me, for 1,000 yards in the first five games of the season. He was taken out of the game with a fair amount of time remaining, more than five minutes, and fell nine yards short. But nevertheless, Bo thus far with 991 yards on the season. On the Plains, tough weekend for the local teams. Florida State losing at Auburn. Same street body. Bobby Bowden has conquered a lot of foreign turf in his day, but it's the Auburn Tigers who own the deed to his land, be it home or away. Fourth-ranked Seminoles found out it's still a tough road to hoe on the Alabama Plains, as we hear from Bob Warren. For Florida State, the Auburn series has been a litany of losing. In 13 previous meetings, the Seminoles had hit the victory jackpot only once. Today's crapshoot came up snake eyes again. 
Less than two minutes into the game, bullet back Bo Jackson set the tone. He took the handoff at the 47, bounced outside, and was gone. Greg Newell missed the tackle, as did Stan Shiver, and then Martin Mayhew. The Heisman Trophy shoe-in broke it for 53 yards and the touch. It was 7-0 Auburn. But Florida State answered right away with the score on their initial possession with a Bobby Bowden staple, the old reverse. Danny McManus to Tony Smith to Darren Holloman who ran an untouched from the four to square it at seven all. At that time, it didn't seem all that crucial, but it was a sign of things to come. Mistakes with a capital M. Derek Schmidt could have given Florida State a 10-7 lead, but he missed a chippy field goal from 28 yards out, one of two misses on the day. However, this cloud had a silver lining. Auburn got the ball back and three plays later, stumbled. Quarterback Pat Washington tried to hit Jeff Parks in the flat. Eric Williams knocked the ball into the air and then caught it. He was off to the races, 17 yards for the touchdown. Florida State led it 14 to seven. And that's the way the first quarter ended. The clubs then resurrected the childhood game of follow the leader. Auburn riding the wheels of halfback Brent Fullwood moved the ball downfield with ease. That set the table for Reggie Ware and everybody's least favorite highlight, the one-yard fullback dive into the end zone. It was 14 apiece with eight minutes left in the second. The seesaw then swung back into Florida State's favor. Derek Schmidt boomed a 42-yard field goal and the Seminoles led 17-14. It was their last lead of the day. Auburn came right back with three of their own. Chris Knapp hit this 34-yarder and it was 17-17 at the mid-break. Time to take stock, to pass along information, and any Auburn fan who wanted to ride. In the second half, it was Auburn that gave Florida State the ride. After an Eric Thomas interception, the Tigers marched downfield and scored. When Brent Fullwood followed student body left into the end zone, 24-17. Less than a minute later, Bo Jackson put seven more on the board with one of his patented runs. Pure power with layers of speed. He went 35 yards down the sideline to jack the lead to 31-17. But Florida State refused to fold. Tony Smith scooted in from two yards out. It was 31-24 with 5.01 left. That's when the wheels came off, save for Derek Schmidt's field goal. In the next five minutes, the War Eagle would flap his wings to the point of exhaustion. Auburn scored 28 unanswered points. It began here when wide receiver Freddie Wigand took the end around and scored from 14 yards out, 38-27. On the very next play, a rusty Eric Thomas put up a wounded quail. Kevin Porter picked it off and had nothing but green acreage in front. He returned at 34 yards for the score, 45-27. I think maybe if I'd have played a couple of ball games before, that uh, I'd have had a feeling of it. Just 45 seconds later, Chip Ferguson took over for Thomas. The freshman was hit in the back. The ball floated into the hands of defensive tackle Ron Stallworth, who lumbered in every sense of the term 22 yards for the touchdown, 52-27. It got worse. 22 seconds later, Ferguson took the snap, or rather didn't. Auburn recovered. A couple of plays later, Demetrius Threat ran it in from eight yards out to make the final score 59 to 27. After it was all over, Bo Jackson described things perfectly. And it just went haywire in the fourth quarter. It was like twilight zone out there. As for Florida State, no excuses were necessary or offered. I thought we'd win the ball game. The game, up to the first 55 minutes, we were behind, what, seven points, something like that, or four points or something. So we were in it for 55 minutes, and then they, they busted it wide open. The Seminoles fall to four and one, and surely out of the top ten. Bob Warren, Channel 6, Eyewitness Sports, Tallahassee. The Florida a and is in on former or Florida State quarterback Danny McManus, and I'm happy to tell you it's good news. Doctors have determined that the dizzy spells he has been suffering originated in the inner ear not the central nervous system as first feared. However, it's gonna take some time to heal. He will be out of action a minimum of one month. McManus, who was pulled from last Saturday's Auburn game because of recurring dizzy spells, underwent more tests today under the direction of Tallahassee neurologist, Dr. Fred Vroom. After considering all the facts, Dr. Vroom said, quoting here, Danny's symptoms indicate a problem with the left inner ear. His symptoms and changes in tests are typical of what can occur with a blow to the head. I would expect gradual improvement and complete recovery. How quickly this occurs is undetermined. It could be several weeks. It may take longer. The problem stems from McManus being knocked out against Nebraska and Memphis State in back-to-back -back games in September. He will be allowed to take part in running and throwing drills and practice with the team. But he must undergo weekly evaluation by team doctors and Vroom to check his progress. Good news all the way around. The weekly UPI poll arrived this afternoon, and the Florida State Seminoles should feel fortunate that they're still within the reach of the nation's elite. 
The Tribe tumbled seven notches in the poll after the trouncing they took over the weekend at the hands of Auburn. The Iowa Hawkeyes are number one for the third week in a row. Oklahoma is still in the runner-up spot. Michigan is third, followed by Penn State, and the Arkansas Hogs are fifth. Nebraska starts the second five, while the Tigers from Auburn jump to seventh. The rest of the top ten has BYU, the Air Force, and Ohio State. The Knowles are 11th, as I mentioned, while Georgia and Alabama are tied for the 14th spot. Ready or not, here it comes. Football team officially open press down onto the field. Now this is a team that's starting to run the option to perfection. Last week they picked up 526 yards of total offense and beat Long Beach State in the final seconds, 37 to 35. Now Long Beach isn't a powerhouse, but 526 yards is still plenty of real estate. Being an option team, it all starts with our quarterback, Steve Gage, and he's, he's not a bad option quarterback. He's got good speed and throws the ball well, and he's been our trigger man. He's our leader. And then we have Gordon Brown, who is our leading rusher. He averages seven yards per carry, and we uh, try to get the ball to him. Of course, about the only thing that Long Beach State and Florida State have in common is their last name. FSU is a far better team. But quarterback Steve Gage thinks that the Hurricane has a chance. I'm not in prediction business. I don't know if we can or not. We just have to come out here and see tomorrow, and that's why we play the game of football, to, to see who can beat each other. So, you know, any given Saturday, anything can happen, I believe. And on out against Tulsa this evening, Bob Warren is standing by live at the War Zone for a damage report. Robert? I am here at the War Zone, Scotty. Thank you very much. What happened here tonight will forevermore be known as the spirit of 76, as in points scored by Florida State, the most ever in the school's history. You know, all week long, you can sense the blowout was coming. This was a massacre. Four flat tires and no spare. The Seminoles totally annihilated Tulsa by the tune of 76 to 14. Oh, my. The Golden Hurricane did bring some unexpected rain. Made things a little nasty for the crowd, but believe me, they got happy in a hurry. Derek Schmidt began this party seven minutes into the first quarter with a mere 46-yard field goal, three zip FSU. You know, after the Memphis State game, Bobby Bowden said his players were abused. Tonight, they did the abusing. Garth Jacks on the sack, a loss of eight. On the next play, Tulsa's Richie Stevenson putted. Now watch freshman Deion Sanders work magic. He hauls it in at the 40 and breaks outside, appears to be gone. But Terry Robinson, his own man, slows him down a bunch. He still picked up 34 yards before Stevenson made the saving tackle. He should have saved himself the trouble. On the next play, Eric Thomas, making his first start of the year, found a wide open, I mean wide open, Pat Carter for a 26-yard touchdown. He literally could have crawled in. It took all of four seconds. Now, point after attempts never make the highlights, except when it's a record attempt. Derek Schmidt converts for his 57th straight. A new FSU standard, it was 10 to nothing. Then the fun began. Tulsa quarterback Steve Gage, who couldn't breathe all night, tried to hit his tight end over the middle, but Stan Schreiber goes up, up, and muscles it away for the interception. Two INTs on the night for Schreiber. A couple of lit plays later, Pensacola freshman Victor Floyd turned that mistake into points. Following excellent blocking by Pat Carter and Jamie Dukes, he goes in untouched from two yards out, 17 zip FSU. Now here's the closest this game ever got. Tulsa's Rodney Young busted up the gut, shakes off a couple of tackles first by Fred Jones and then Greg Newell. He battles in from 14 yards out. It was 17-7. Following another long Deion Sanders punt return, Tony Smith did the honors from six yards out, 27-7. Stan Schreiber picked off another Tulsa pass, and again, Tony Smith made the most of it, popping it up the middle for a 20-yard score. It was 34-7. Smith had a terrific game, 147 yards in the first half alone. Then with time ticking down in the first half, Eric Thomas hit Hassan Jones, who stretches his body to the limit. He pulls in a 34-yard TD strike, 41-7 at halftime. Now, everybody was scurrying for the record book to find out the most points ever scored by an FSU team. Officially, it was 66 against Memphis State in 1979. The record breaker came here when Chip Ferguson hit Philip Bryant with a nine-yard touch. That made it 69-7. to Among the other highlights, how about a mere 100-yard interception return by Deion Sanders, also a new record. Final score from Doe Campbell Stadium tonight. 76 to 14 Florida State. Now the spirit of 76 was certainly evident in the FSU locker room. Uh, to overstate the obvious, Bobby Bowden was pleased to the max. It's, uh, line control the line of scrimmage. Defensive line uh, control the line of scrimmage. Uh, Tulsa is a good offensive football team. They've been that way all year. They've led, gosh, they've led nearly about everybody they played. So they did in Arkansas, because they did Arkansas, Arkansas did 24 nothing. 
but we, every time we saw them play this year, we noticed every time we looked on the board, the first game, they were ahead. So those were gaping, gaping holes. And um, all I had to do was just take it up in there and run. Were you feeling better than you felt all season tonight? Um, I felt pretty good tonight. I think I came in a little bit overweight, um, gained some pounds last week. But um, overall, you know, I'm losing my focus tonight. I thought that we'd find out something about them tonight, Gary. I felt like if we were a good football team, we would come back and play like a good football team is supposed to play after they get beat, kind of like Auburn did to Ole Miss, kind of like Nebraska did to Illinois. And uh, if we came out and played a lousy game, I'd say we're, we're very much overrated. Scotty, what else is there to say? 76 to 14, the final from Doe Campbell Stadium tonight. Next week, it's on to Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in a battle with those Tar Heels. Hmm. Indeed, enough said. It was I'm there. It's time for another great moment in Florida State football history with former Seminoles Burt Reynolds and Vic Frenzy. Burt, let's go back to 1980, Florida State, Florida. Great ball game. Very difficult situation for Florida State. That's, of course, remember correctly, the Seminoles were ranked in the top ten that year. Yeah, uh, they wanted to be on tel national television. Wanted to be and, on national television. In order to be on national television, uh, they had to have a buy, as it's called, right? Uh, or an open date. Open date uh, for four weeks, which is a long time to uh, to work on one <laughs> your passing game or your running, running game. game. I mean, uh, especially when you're you, the guys are all up, uh, they sort of time it. You know, you, you get down in that schedule where you really are. You you got everything, the adrenaline, everything's pumping six to seven days later after the the game, and suddenly it's four weeks before you're going to play a football game. Four weeks for that ball game, Bert, that long layoff, plus the fact that the Seminoles had already been selected to play in the Orange Bowl, and they were playing against a Fighting Gator team that uh, hadn't won too many ball games that year. It was Charlie Pell's first season. Yeah, Charlie Char Char Pell uh, is quoted as saying that uh, I've never been so happy. Uh, uh, to see a graduating class graduate. As a matter of fact, he talked about coming to the graduation. He was so happy to see two great linebackers graduate. Uh, That's Ron Simmons. Uh, Ron Simmons. Uh, Paul Pawlowski. Paul Pawlowski, who, who is a great football Richard player. Herring. Richard Herring. Richard uh, Herring. A couple of uh, terrific running backs. Uh, one of my favorite running backs, as you know. Right, uh, Ricky Williams. But Ricky was just coming on. Sam Platt, that was Sam's last year. So Sam Platt was the, was the noted runner uh, right. of, the, of the team. Uh, got her. Yeah, and he got hurt, and so we needed Ricky then in the second half did. a lot. Certainly did, because the Gators that year went out uh, 13 and nothing in the first half, leading us. First time yeah. they went to some of and, and the, the, the uh, Florida fans went crazy because uh, they thought uh, that was going to be it. The time was coming. They beat, at that time, they had not beaten the Seminoles uh, in three years. But with a score of 13 and up, and the Seminoles had to come out that second half or be embarrassed because they were going to the Orange Bowl. They were playing, like I say, a Gator team that I think had only won uh, maybe one ball game that year. But uh, with Sam flat out, it didn't look good. And your man, uh, Ricky Williams, came back and got the job done. The important thing is it was the last time that we beat the Gators. Well, Bert, maybe this year. Maybe 1985 would be the year the Seminoles come back. But 1980, as we talked about, the last time the Seminoles beat the Gators. The score, 17-13. Join us again next week for another great moment in Florida State football with Burt Reynolds and Vic Frenzy. All the excitement of Florida State football is available without... Paul, the UPI top 10 hot off the presses. Let's take a look. Florida State back in the big time. Any question as to who is number one? None at all. Iowa, after their dramatic last-second win over Michigan Saturday, retained their numero uno ranking. Penn State's Nittany Lions on the climb, though. This is a surprise. They're trying harder at number two. The Nebraska Cornhuskers have climbed all the way back up to number three. Michigan did not fall all that far after losing to the Hawkeyes. They're fourth, and the Auburn Tigers climb back into the top five. The unbeaten Falcons of Air Force are sixth, followed by BYU, the Ohio State Buckeyes. Florida State moves back into the top ten. They're number nine, and Oklahoma falls to tenth after the Sooners lost to Miami. Now, we'll run down the rest of the top 20 for you tonight at 11 o'clock. It was, to say the least, a very successful weekend for Tallahassee's two college football teams. Florida State back in the elite after walloping Tulsa at Doe Campbell Stadium. And Florida A&M's Rattlers overcame fumbleitis and a constant rainstorm to win the Orange Blossom Classic down in Miami. 
As Don Evans now tells us, both reached goals in their game. Against Tulsa over the weekend was just what the doctor ordered, a confidence-building domination for the Seminoles, but no one expected it to be 76-14. to There was something that had to do with that outcome besides the obvious mismatch in talent, though. The Tribe felt they wanted to get back on track and put the Auburn game completely in the past. I think our boys were super fired up because of that. They blocked better than I've ever seen them block. Not that that's the end of the pressure the Seminoles are putting on themselves. The North Carolina game is very much on their minds, too. It's a game we, we need to win, uh, just like with all of them are important. We've, we've, had our, uh, we've had our little liability. Florida A&M's Rattlers are... Apple Hill, North Carolina, a homecoming of sorts for Seminole quarterback Chip Ferguson, who grew up right down the road from Chapel Hill in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'd like to get a lot of playing time and um, do a good job. And... and um, show people what Florida State's all about, you know, show them how, how we get big in football. And, you know, because a lot of people from my hometown, they don't know how it is down here. I mean, I, I didn't know how it was before I came down here. I just like to go up there and get a lot of playing time and do a good job. Now, homecoming number four. Tied at 10 with under three minutes to go at North Carolina. They get a 54-yard field goal from Derek Schmidt. Then Martin Mayhew, and oh, by the way, 62-yard interception return for a touchdown. Florida State wins it by 10, 20 to 10, despite six Seminole turnovers.